Um, so, hey, welcome to Right Hive Sunday. Thanks for joining us uh, early on, on a Sunday. Uh, I'm Mike Pietschek, uh, and we're with soyouwanttowrite.org. Basically, we connect writers with literary experts, agents, authors, editors, so that you can improve your writing and get published. And before I introduce Sam, I want to invite you again to sign up for our Writer High Five. It's just a weekly roundup of the best writer stuff from around the world. So go to soyouwanttowrite.org slash WH5, and you can sign up from there. And uh, if you like what you hear from Sam today, uh, we do offer one-on-one -on -one meetings where uh, uh, Sam will read the first 20 pages of your book uh, and a synopsis of your book and then meet with you for 45 minutes to talk about what's working, what could be improved. If you want to head over to soyouwanttowrite.org slash Sam, uh, you can book that meeting there and use code write 10 at checkout for 10% off your meeting plus anything else on our site. Uh, so enough about uh, about me. Sam uh, is, is a very old uh, friend and mentor of mine. Uh, we met on his couch. I was in one of his writing workshops in 2012, I think it was. Uh, uh, it seems like it's forever, forever ago, isn't it? We're coming up on 10 years. Uh, but it was the time that I was growing most by far as a writer and it was um, we would read out our pages every week and then get feedback from the group and from Sam and so Sam and I decided hey let's partner up and start offering this um, in a larger scale scale it up and um, here we are so today we are talking about contracts uh, it's a basically a one-on-one -on -one look at what do you expect when you're signing a book deal what should you look for in the contract uh, it's primary rights uh, your, your advances your royalties your territories Secondary rights for ebooks, audio, translations, your film and TV options, and and so hopefully you know if you're if you're here you're getting close to thinking about this and you're ready to to start looking for book deals. So this will hopefully help you find uh, something that works for you. About Sam, Sam is a president of the Rights Factory, uh, an international literary agency based in Toronto, and he's been doing this for 30 years. This publishing stuff. He's he's published a whole bunch of New York Times and Globe and Mail bestsellers. Um, if you know, I, I won't throw out too many names, but uh, Jennifer Close, David Gilmore of CBC's Gilmore on the Arts, Mariko Tamaki, Andrew Kaufman, Margot Berwin, Rupinder Gill, uh, a lot of fantastic books that some of them you probably have read uh, are, are Sam's projects. Um, he's edited and represented uh, all genres from debut fiction to memoir to narrative nonfiction, graphic novels, and he teaches creative writing at the University of Toronto. He teaches publishing at Ryerson University. Um, he's just a fantastic font of knowledge, and uh, it's very. We're very happy to have him as part of our our group. So, without further ado, uh, turn it over to Sam. Thanks, Mike. That's that's a, such a nice introduction. I don't think I could have done a better one. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, essentially, I, I started off in publishing, being a, a launching a literary magazine in the '90s, and then I was just out of school. And then that became this cool literary magazine thing. And then I started a press from it, which happens to a lot of people. I didn't realize it, but it had happened historically before that people, once you're connected to writers and you're publishing, it's just easy to start doing books, even though it's not cheap. And then um, eventually I realized that w what I really loved was finding new writers and putting them into the market. And even though I had my own press, it was probably a better idea to try to get those authors to Penguin Random House or HarperCollins or the big five publishers to um, to uh, kind of launch their careers. And then, you know, the agents make a commission on it. And then I, uh, I learned about film and TV that way. I built the agency. We now have about eight agents and a few assistants. And um, I think we're maybe up to about 150 clients, maybe closer to 200. I, I lose track because we're always saying, oh, we should we should work together. And somebody's like, we want to work with you. And and like, I think with all my agents, there's a bunch of people. We're especially interested in the in the kind of recent years in film and TV deals. That's where a lot of money is coming. And so we launched um, a uh, film and TV division of uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We hired our first agent there and we're looking for more. But we're looking for people who have done film and TV deals and want to bring some of their clients to our agency. And we also want them to help our existing clients in that area. So um, I was just telling Mike earlier, for those of you interested in contracts, the Writers Guild in America just last week, like this is crazy timing, just uh, publicly um, made available their like writer notes uh, that they've had for years that they've, if you, if you joined as an author, 
um, they would then give you access to this saying, these are the classic terms in a publishing deal and this is how you should, these are all the things to watch out for. So it's very accessible. So at the end, I'm gonna make sure, or before the end, uh, I'll make sure that I give Mike the link or you could just Google it. They just, you know, it's just there on their site. If there's no longer a paywall, um, but um, it's great to give you the, the the actual what the clause looks like and kind of legalese, what it means for you, and then what you should watch out for to make sure or how you can alter it to make sure it's in your best interest. So um, on that, with that, I'm, I'm happy to start answering questions. I think, I mean, for you guys, you should know that like film and TV and music um, and almost any other area, they're, they're way less kind of, for lack of a word, gentlemanly than publishing. Like old school publishing has always understood that they have a relationship with an author and that if the author becomes important enough, then they become less important and they still want to maintain the relationship, you know? So the standard trajectory is like when you're JK Rowling and you're unknown and they take your first book, you're so grateful. And then they tell you, you have to cut a hundred pages out of it. And you're like, Oh my God, how do I do that? And, and then you end up doing it because they have all the power and then your book comes out and then you become JK Rowling. And then by the, as you guys probably noticed in the series, by the third or fourth book, they're like 800 pages because she's like, yeah, whatever. Like, I'm just going to write whatever and you guys publish it. And they're like, okay, Ms. Rowling, we're not going to, not going to change anything because at that point she could go to any publisher. Right. So the, 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 the power shift is really important to watch. Uh, was there another question? Is there a publishing question? Yeah, so another one from Jay Herlick. What are red flags to look out for when reviewing a contract? Um, red flags are when uh, the, the biggest one to me is if a publisher uh, is... Um, so the general idea in a publishing contract is you've written the book, you're the copyright holder, and you're licensing work through the publisher. So the biggest red flag, and I don't know if this even happens anymore, but it, some of the smaller presses may still be doing it. But what it is is the publisher says, okay, we're going to give you money and we're going to buy the rights to your work, and now we own it. And then we're going to license it and make money on it. And then you're you're out. See you later. Bye. You know, you so that's a big that's really dangerous because now you don't have the copyright anymore because you didn't understand the contract. So make sure that that you are the copyright holder and you haven't given it to the publisher. Um, in the past, in the origins of publishing, if you were, you know, I feel like uh, some of those really early poets, um, you know, like uh, if you were like John Donne or somebody in the 16th or 17th century writing poetry or, or I guess novels hadn't been invented yet. But in those days, you would give the copyright to the publisher. They would give you like, five pounds, which is probably a lot of money back then. And then you, they would own it and publish it. And then you, that would be the end of it. You would be associated with it. It would have your name on it, but that's it. You wouldn't see another dime. So that's probably the biggest red flag. The, the thing that I'm seeing in a lot of contracts now that I don't really like is more and more publishers are trying to get a bit of, or a lot of the film and TV money, if that ever happens in the future. And so, I mean, it's always a bit of a gamble, but I always worry if a publisher says we can only do this deal if we get half of the film money. I mean, it's theoretical at that point. That's a lot of money. I mean, you know, even the film agent would only make between 10 or 20%. So why does the publisher get 50%? So sometimes um, when I look at, you know, when I represent somebody and I look at a, a deal that they did before, I have to look at the contract and say, these contracts are wrong. We have to go back and try to fix them. I'm not always able to do it. But um, the publisher has to recognize that they've overstepped or that they've um, because they've already got a signed contract. Right. Remember, if the person who signed it gave away these rights and didn't know what they were doing, um, <clears throat> then um, it, it becomes the agent's job to try to fix that. So I guess a related question here from Monjo, what are clauses we want to avoid? Any specifics? Um, it, it can get into a lot of detail, so I don't want to get I don't want to get into too much detail. I think for those of you who have a legal mind or like details, uh, when I post the link at the end, you should read through it if if you have a contract um, if you have a contract question um, because it's very good advice and it's basically free legal advice. 
Mm -hmm. So that, that would otherwise cost you thousands of dollars. Um, in terms of general clauses, um, Publishers try to control as much as possible. And one of the things that as agents we try to do is we try to give you like a seat at the table. So they will say that we will control the cover and the design and the marketing and we'll control all of it. And what we we try to do is we, we adjust some of the clauses to say, okay, fine, but you have to jointly approve. So it's not just the publisher decides, but the author and the publisher together say, we both like this cover. This is the cover we're going to go with. Um, or we both like, you know, uh, it's usually, you know, the, the interior design and the cover are the most important things, but sometimes it's the title. You, you don't want to have your publisher saying, we have the right to change the title of your book. And then you're like, wait, it's my book. Right. So a lot of these things, the publisher says, we don't trust you. You're just a writer. What do you know about publishing? We're the experts. So let us do all this. Um, and then your job is to say, wait, it's my work. So, you know, I, I, we have to both agree. So that's always a good situation. Sometimes if you become really big, you have complete control over everything because they're going to just give it to you. They're going to say, we're not going to mess with you. Even if we had a black cover and just the, 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 the title in white, you know, that's going to sell the book because of what the book is and because of who you are. So, um, uh, you know, it, it depends on where you are in your career as a writer. But in the beginning, when they first give you that contract, nine out of 10 writers are just so happy to have a publishing deal by a legitimate publisher that they just sign it. And they don't even they're just they don't even read the details. And that's always a bad idea, because, like I said, sometimes I have to go back and fix it. Um, things like, you know, when a publisher overstretches like translation rights, film rights, uh, you know, even audio rights now, more and more agents are holding back because audio has become so big and there's a lot of money in it. Sometimes you can get more money for the audio edition than for the print book itself, especially during the pandemic when people are, you know, bookstores aren't necessarily always open and um, you can just download the file or the ebook. So those sales have gone up. And so those parts of the contract where you're discussing the deal for the, you know, the royalties for the audiobook or the ebook are more important. Great. So another question uh, from Battlebeard, is there anything you can do if you sign a contract with a small press and they just don't do anything with the book? Is that a common scenario, Sam? It's a very common scenario. They might even promise things verbally, oh, we'll do this and that, and then they don't do it. So, and most of them won't put that in a contract because sometimes they'll say, will you put that in the contract? And they'll say, no, <laughs> we're not gonna put that in the contract because then it becomes, then you can, you can basically say, you didn't meet your end of the contract. It's a breach of contract. I'm getting the rights back. So um, I guess for that question, uh, the first thing is, do they have copyright uh, have they licensed the copyright for, for the full term of copyright? Um, so just as an aside, uh, traditionally, um, like let's say you get a foreign language deal for your book and somebody wants to translate it. So if they want to translate it, that's usually uh, a term, like a finite term. They can have it for like seven years or five years or whatever, and then they have to decide to renew it or not. But most of the English language publishers now are pushing for it's called the full term of copyright, meaning if they sign the contract with you, they have the rights to sell this book for up to 70 years after your death, which is a long time, right? Because considering your age now and how long you're going to live and then 70 years after that. So that's why you have situations where there are lots of multiple lawsuits over, over copyright, like with Superman. The characters, the guys that made Superman... Uh, sold it for like $100 when they were teenagers because they were, I think they were like 18 when they created it together. And uh, and then later on, Superman became this thing. And then their family said, you ripped us off. Like you took advantage of these kids. They didn't even know what they were doing. Um, and then there were a lot of millions of dollars that came later for the families. But because the copyright is, is basically, I mean, Superman will go into the public domain. Uh, I think one or both of those guys are still alive, but it's going to be, you know, like another hundred years, maybe. Um, so I guess uh, that that's an important thing to understand. If, if you sign this contract with a small press and it says the full term of copyright, then what you have to do is go back to them, maybe with a legal letter and say, look, um, when I signed this contract, it was with these expectations nothing's happened. Uh, you're doing nothing with my work. Um, I would, and the, usually there's an out of print clause. 
um, that's really important because um, if you, most contracts, it says if the book is selling like less than a hundred copies a year or, or every six months or whatever, or, or um, not earning this kind of money, like either it's like a unit, like 50 units or a hundred units or um, a dollar amount. Like if it's not uh, earning you, you know, 250 or $500 or whatever, then you, the author, can go to the publisher and say, I'd like the rights back. I'd like for you to make the book go out of print and then have, you know, I can do whatever I want as the author. If that clause isn't in there, then you'd have to make a case that whatever promises the publisher made in the contract haven't been kept, and so you want the rights back. And then they might say, you know, fine, but we spent this much money on it. We want you to pay the money and then you'll say we'll give you like a small piece of that and then give us right to back. so it would become a legal issue if there was nothing in the contract that said you could in fact declare the book out of print so battle beard beard hopefully that gives you some leads to to look into um if you have you any also look at the link when i have the contract even though um it may be too late to, to fix that one mm -hmm. genimal asks is it a bad idea to sign a contract without an agent like with harlequin uh with harlequin did you say yeah. is harlequin the, the press yeah it looks like um in this case it's the the press right publisher okay so uh, i don't know that even an agent could change a lot of harlequin's terms i feel like they would want to have the world rights in all languages including film and tv and i would assume that you think it's a good deal and it's probably if it's um if you're writing a kind of romance they might be the best publisher for you I think what you might want to do is look at the splits in terms of what they're taking. If they're taking half of the film rights, I would try to push back and say, look, you take take 10% of the film rights and give me 90%. It's my work, you know? So unless, of course, the thing about Harlequin is Harlequin may have a deal with, um, like, Hallmark TV, because I've noticed that Hallmark has this channel now, and there's all these the Harlequins that are coming on as um, made-for-TV movies. So there could be some money for you there. Like the danger is if, if, if a publisher wants the film and TV rights and they're actually gonna do something with it, that's okay as long as they get a fair split. Uh, the problem is when they don't do anything with it and then they want you or your agent or other people down the road to do all this work for them and they're just sitting on the rights. That's kind of like rights squatting, you know, it's not, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, Stephanie S asks, how much leeway do authors and their agents have in terms of negotiation when they're a de debut author? So that is a great question. I think it depends on the publisher. Most publishers want to establish a relationship with you where if your book takes off that you're gonna stick around and not say, oh my God, you screwed me on that first contract. I hate you. I'm never gonna work with you again. Nobody wants to be in that position. So they're gonna to listen to you, but they might be really tough. I mean, I think we had a situation at the agency where we had a debut author and they wanted uh, they definitely, they said, we can't do this without the film and TV rights. So we had to come, go back and push and push and push to kind of limit the amount that they were going to get. But then we also asked for a reversion of rights, which is an important thing to note that in almost everything in the contract, you can stipulate that if, if this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen within a period of time, then the rights go back from the publisher to the author. So I think we said, if you can't sell the film or TV rights within two years after publication, then we get the rights back. Because um, it, often these film or TV things take 10 or, or five or 10 years anyway. It's, it's really rare that you have something that is so timely. Like an example of, of the opposite of that is, is like The Hate You Give. The book came out and then it was, it was, it was the, because of Black Lives Matter happening everywhere, the, um, the TV or the film option got exercised right away and then just i think less than a year after the book came out the movie was out which almost never happens hollywood never goes that fast unless they see that there's something in the in the the uh kind of zeitgeist and they want to take advantage of it uh so more more realistically if you look at the queen's gambit on netflix that book had been around for 20 years and just somebody just said oh my god i love this story i think now's the time to make this into a series Great. Where was I? Questions. Um, Mel asks, how should the clause look for following manuscripts? I think I think uh, they mean a second and third manuscript. So yeah, you can options. also sell them to somebody else. 
Yeah, okay, so publishers are, I have to tell you, it's kind of sad. When I first started as an agent, it was, I think, 2003, and whenever I saw a contract, I talked to, you know, the I worked at a bigger agency at the beginning, and I talked to my boss, and I talked to our lawyers that we had on, on retainer, and we would always be able to take out the option on the next book. We'd say, you know, they'd say, we're publishing your book, we love you, and when you have your next book, you have to show it to us before you show it to anybody else. And it's called the right of first refusal. So it may, in other words, they get the chance to refuse it first before anybody else. And they ask for an exclusive period to look at it. And I would say, let's take this out. Like, and I would, I would argue, I think logically that if the author has a good experience with you, then they'll come back and then, you know, let's do this. Uh, you know, they like working with you. But what if something changes? What if that editor who bought the book goes somewhere else? And, and you know, that that's not, uh, the person doesn't feel as good about the comp coming back with a second book or anything could happen. So, so I was able to take those out. But what I'm noticing now, is, as especially when publishers are merging and they're becoming like one publishing company, um, or, you know, it used to be the big seven, then it was the big six, now it's the big five. And then if, if Penguin and Random House merge with Simon & Schuster, it's gonna be the big four. Um, and already I think Harper Collins is buying um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and even Houghton, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt were two different companies that merged. So you know, Harcourt was separate a long time ago. So it's weird watching it, it happen, but there's probably gonna be one publishing company in like five years. Um, so it gets getting harder and harder to get that right of first refusal out. And so now um, what we're doing is we're saying, fine, we will give you 30 days to look at the next project, but we try to limit that project. So one way you could limit it is if if they're publishing, uh, let's say a nonfiction book or a novel, whatever it is, then we say, okay, fine. The next book that is the same category as the first book, you can look at that first. But if they write some other kind of book, we can go, we can do whatever we, we, we want. We don't have any responsibility to you for that. And then we say you get 30 days, assuming it's the same genre as the first one, to look at it. And if you're if we can't come to some kind of deal, then we're free to shop it around elsewhere. So that's a standard writer first refusal clause. But I'm noticing that more and more they're trying to clamp down on that. And and most recently they've been adding clauses that say, and with this seems so unfair to me, and I, I try to. I think I've taken it out every single time, and most of them are amenable to it. The problem is, you know, you have very little power when there's only one deal. Everybody else has said no, and now it's just a question of, of you know, who, the, the give and take of that negotiation. And most writers um, are intimidated by contracts, and um, sometimes it's a bad idea to get a lawyer because some lawyers who are not publishing lawyers will look at it and they don't know what standard either. So I've seen cases where people hired a lawyer, spent a lot of money, and didn't get a very good contract because the lawyers were not publishing people. It's very specific. You kind of have to be looking at publishing contracts daily, you know, to see how they change over time. Um, but I mean, noticing that that, that right of first refusal has become, you know, not just a right of first refusal, meaning that, okay, I'm gonna make an offer on it. And if we say, yeah, we, we're not happy with that offer. We think it's worth more. We're gonna go somewhere else. Then they say, okay, fine, if you do that, then whatever offer you get, you have to come back to us and we have the right to match it. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. You've already said no, or we've already said no. It wasn't enough. If we get double the money, we can't come back to you. And I, and then you're going to say, well, great, we'll give you double the money now the book is ours. Because we just went around to all these other publishers and then we're going to create a lot of Bad will with these people because they were hoping to get the book. They made an offer that was more than you guys made, and now you're going to take it. Like so, I always try to. Sometimes authors sign that because I've looked at it. I'm like, why did you sign this? And they didn't know what they were signing, and now they're they're kind of, um, you know, they're limited by their options in terms of that next book. They're they it's like basically they've got one high one hand tied behind their back, you know, in the negotiations. That's interesting. So there's um, there's another one from Monjo. Can the author ask that contract disputes be settled in their local jurisdiction? They can Very ask. Specific, but it, they, they won't give it to you because the the publishers, uh, their lawyers, when they do those contracts, they need to understand that the it's like basically the law of the company, and I think. It's very, it's very rare. Like most times, most companies just won't, they won't change that because it's, 
they don't know what they they don't necessarily know the laws of any other jurisdiction. They know the laws that they're operating under. So it's not even it's almost not fair to ask them because what you're saying is so if we have a fight, you know, I live in this state, you're in that state. I want to go with the law with the laws of my state. They're, and they would say, we're the ones that put all this money to publish the book. Like we feel like, you know, we made an investment. So it has to be where we are because we know the laws here. We, we're not going to have time to figure out the laws where you are. So I think that's a very tough ask. Okay, great. Um, if you have more questions, uh, everyone, please post them in the chat or we'll see if we can um, unmute the channel and get a discussion going. But there's one more I see here from Gina Mull. If it goes out of print, do they still own the copyright? I assume they mean the publisher. Do the publisher still own the copyright? No, when it, something goes out of print, usually it says that the rights revert back to the author, meaning that the copyrights go back. So everything goes back to the author. And then uh, sometimes when this has happened, authors have self-published and made a whole other, had a whole second career with those books, and sometimes made more money than the first time, uh, or um, they've resold it to another publisher. So ideally, you want if I mean when you're a writer, you're basically like an inventor, right? Like uh, under the law, copyrights go under intellectual property like inventions. So it's like you invented something. And for you to, to have written these things and you own the rights to it and, and they're not being exploited, whether it's like in a, in a print format or audio format or film and TV, whatever, all the different ways you can make money from your work, uh, it's, not really, you're not, it's not really earning for you. So you kind of, uh, you know, as a writer, and you have, if you have a body of work, you have to see it as like a mutual fund portfolio where you've got all these different things that you made and you have to figure out how to make money at it. And sometimes, one of the most interesting and exciting things for writers, I think, is this in the new world of technology, you have you can have this hybrid model where sometimes one of the big publishers will want to do something with you and other times they won't. So in, in that case, you it's so easy to self-publish these days or, or kind of build an online brand as an author, even though it will take a it's easy, I mean, in that it's still gonna be work and money the way that anything would be, but it's it's the, all that technology wasn't there even 20 or 25 years ago and and you couldn't have done it you couldn't it would have been almost impossible to reach the people that you can now then um i'll just stop it right there right and so i think there's a follow-up on that one sam if it doesn't say that the rights revert in the contract and then it goes out of print are you out of luck uh no you you have copyright on. Yeah, copyright goes stays with the author. So unless you spec you specified that that uh, you are giving them the rights and it's not a license, you would have a case. Uh, I'm saying if it goes out of print, you have a case that you could argue that, and you I'd have to look at the language. But um, you definitely would have a case to go to say, okay, fine, I'm going to do it. I would even say if you talk to a lawyer, go ahead and do something with the new work and wait till the publisher reapproaches you, and you'd say, look, it's out of print. So. Okay. Which questions did I miss? Let's see. We have, um, oh, um, the Chai T asks, are there any clauses that are left out, I, I suppose, in, in, in commonly left out uh, that we should be aware of and fight to put back in? Anything the publishers um, try to leave out intentionally? So uh, the other two things, one is some publishers don't have insurance, media insurance for their authors. And I always, I always have to ask. So some publishers do, because if there's any kind of litigation around your book, you want to be covered under their insurance if they have it. And so a lot of the big publishers automatically have it. It's in their contract. They're like, well, you will be uh, covered as an insured in our media insurance in case there's a problem. Um, so that's... Uh, a really important thing to ask for the second one is there are a bunch of things that are kind of like their responsibility and they will often take it out of the contract and so for example the right that the author has to look at their books to do like an audit a financial audit to, to kind of reconcile how they feel the book is selling and how the book is actually selling so they will often take that out so you have to say we want the right to audit the books and if there's a discrepancy we want to get a fee like we want to get a check or a payment within like you know 30 days uh if there's a discrepancy from what you say we sold and what our accountants have found uh, in your books um i think the 
the Writers Guild in the, in New York has uh, a forensic accountant on staff that will do this for clients. You just have to book them in advance and they'll go in and they'll do it. But if it's not in the contract, then it's not in the contract. So you you don't really, you can argue that it's an important thing and that you're, you can audit the publisher's books, but they'll say it's not even in the contract. Like we don't need, we don't need to, to listen to you. Interesting. And I think maybe you touched on this a little bit, but Monjo is asking, are publishing lawyers available to find locally or should we look for a lawyer in the same jurisdiction as the publisher? I would honestly, uh, if it's a if it's a book contract, I would, and if this, you're in America, I would look for somebody in New York who is a publishing lawyer only, because there there are people like that. Um, and uh, I, I was in a situation where I had a client who, uh, because of the nature of the book, he wanted to get a legal some legal advice. So even though I had come back to him with an offer, and I said, "This is the offer," he said, "Great, Sam." Hold your thoughts. I want to get uh, a publishing lawyer to look at it, and partly because this guy had spent like twenty years on Wall Street, you know, so he was just really detail oriented. And then I said, you know, half of the lawyers are going to come back with weird stuff. They they don't understand publishing contracts. He's like, I'll make sure I get somebody. And I was so impressed because he called around and he found somebody who was when I looked at the notes, I'm like, these are all exact notes that I would have like all the way through. And they came up with one or two things that I never would have thought of. And I'm like, wow, that's where having a publishing expert, even though I'm doing contracts all the time, but you have to remember, you know, an agent, our main job is to do the deal to kind of get the parties together, the publisher and the author. It's not to work, uh, to tell you all the things wrong with the contract, even though we can do that. And we'll tell you, this is not standard, this is not standard. But usually the authors are like, I don't care. I want to get my book out. Like, let's try to fix it as much as we can. But, you know, they're really, the, their driving thing is they can just see the book coming out. And especially if it's with a bigger publisher, they're just so excited, right? Like, because it's like a dream come true. And in the case of this guy, partly because he had a full career on Wall Street and this was like a fun project for him, just wanted to make sure that all of his I's were dotted and, and the T's were crossed. So right. to be fair, you know, did he spend the money wisely? Well, he had the money. So that's one thing. Not everybody has that kind of money to pay for the lawyer. I think the lawyer was three or $400 an hour to look at the contract. Um, but it was a, a, it was somebody very good. And I, I agreed with all of it. There were one or two things they asked for that I thought were really big asks. And I said, you know, this, this lawyer is really pushy. <laughs> like I, I'd already negotiated, negotiated one or two of them and I was fine with it because it, to me it was a fair deal. But anyway, so um, yeah. And, and, and if it's a film or TV contract, it's even more complicated. I would say you want to have somebody, if, if the deal is going to be in LA, you want to have somebody in LA to help you because they're really up to speed. Like I had um, a major network. I'm actually working on a deal with a major network right now. And when I got the offer, Offer had five points, and I'm still, you know, we just launched a, a book to film and TV division, so I'm still learning. I've only done like maybe 20, 20 film deals in my life, whereas I've done more, um, uh, like maybe almost two hundred book deals. But anyway, so um, I was looking at this thing, and I called some of my contacts, and I said, "This is like a very minimal offer, you know. It's had like five things, and I'm lucky. One of my clients was a major TV um, exec for thirty years and an entertainment lawyer, and he said, Sam." Um, you can't afford me because I know his rate is like a thousand dollars an hour, or whatever. He's a partner at a law firm. He said, "But I'm you're you sold my book, and I'm grateful because you're you're a good agent. But you film stuff is really different. Let me get back to you." So he and an associate went through the contract, and they came back. It was so funny when I looked at it. It had the original things that the network said we can give you these five things, and then he said. There are 11 more things you have to ask for. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know. So I looked at this thing. And so I went back to them and then they were really impressed because they're like, wow, this we thought this was like some small agency in Toronto and we could just get them to whatever. But I went back to them with the kind of thing that a, a, a big agency like ICM or CAA in Los Angeles would have done. And so they they looked at it and they said, okay, well, so we're, we can give you, you know, instead of the five things, now we were negotiating 16. And I think... Two of the things they said no to right away, but I kind of knew that. And sometimes in negotiations, you ask for a lot knowing that they're going to have to give you something. So if you ask for two things back, you're going to say no to one, and then all you have is one thing. You ask for 11 things back, and you lose like two or three things, but then you still have seven or eight things you're going to get. 
So it, okay. it's always, there's a whole strategy to negotiation that you learn as an agent over time. Helpful to have an agent. Always, always, yeah. Um, so I think Battlebeard asks, getting New York, New York lawyer sounds very expensive. Am I wrong? I think that was answered. The answer is yes, lawyers are expensive, period. Especially when they're um, experts. SW yeah, so right, way. right, exactly. Uh, SW Eon asks, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the situation, but how do you avoid a years-long legal mess like what Peter S. Beagle experienced with trying to gain back the rights of his original works? Familiar with that one? I don't know who that is either. Beagle. I mean, can that person, can you tell us? Like, is, do they have audio? Yeah, I don't know if, um, Eon, if you can uh, unmute yourself or just type it out. Uh, author of The Last Unicorn. Familiar? Uh, I don't know the story, but I can look it up. Maybe you can speak generally then to, to what happens when, when someone gets into a long legal battle trying to gain back their rights to their works. Um... You know, I don't know much about it. It's never happened to me, but let me just look mm. up the story. I'm so curious now. He wrote The Last Unicorn, so he... It has to do with his ex-manager, I think, who kind of took advantage of him. Ah. Fraud, be breach of fiduciary duty, defamation. Okay, so I think what you're talking about here is somebody who, um, somebody whose manager uh, is doing legal activities using their names. This happened to Leonard Cohen too. I think Leonard Cohen's manager took $10 million from him. So I think the important thing here is that you need to stay as an author, you need to stay on top of the deals that your your agent is doing. There, I think there was another agency, um, a couple agencies have failed because um, their bookkeeper or their accountant stole money, like embezzled money from the company. So this was a really sad story. If you look up the agency, it's called Donadio Olson, D-O-N-A-D-I-O -O Olson. And they represent people like Chuck Kalaniak, and he was out like a million dollars. This was a shocking case for everybody because Donadio Olson was a blue chip New York agency with a lot of huge authors like, like Chuck Kalaniak, who did Fight Club and a bunch of like uh, several other brilliant books. Um, so, the, the founders of the company weren't paying attention to the bookkeeping and the bookkeeper decided he was going to like buy a house and go on trips. And he had this money there. He found ways to hide how the money was coming in and, and faked reports to the authors. <laughs> so, I mean, in that case, it's very hard if you're an author and they, somebody tells you your book only sold like 2000 copies last year, here's your royalty, but really it sold 20,000 copies and they have, you know, so that is just, I don't know how you can, you know, how you can see that happening except just hired a bad a bad person. Um, the last unicorn sounds like it was slightly different in that it was their manager, but I think you as an author. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the one thing that I think is happening that might be useful for this, and that is the bigger publishers now have author portals. So if you're a Penguin Random House author. Uh, you can sign on to the author portal and you can look at every book that the publisher has done and how many they've sold. So you get the information directly. Your agency gets it and they are collecting the money and they'll send you the, send you your, um, your cut. So you can double, you can verify that your information from the publisher is the same information as from the agent. Cause that's where there could be a problem. That's what happened to Nadia Olson. Um, so the, the other thing is, uh, what I've been doing now is I've been separating the money to make it really clear so people don't even bug me anymore. So what I'll do is I'll say, so our agency commission is 15%, which is pretty standard. I'll say, um, so when you cut the check, you know, Penguin Random House, you send 15% to the agency and send 85% to the author with the statement. So that way there's no, there's no, um, there's no way because you're dealing directly with money and with sales numbers from the publisher. There's no way that the author can, or the agent can uh, screw up hiring somebody or by mismanaging or, or um, purposefully or, or however it happened. Um, there's no way that uh, they can screw that up. So uh, that's a good thing with, um, 
we're doing that more and more because I started reaching the point where people were like, oh, Sam, like, you know, I didn't get a statement from last month. And I'm like, oh, did I get it? So, you know, when there's a point where as a, uh, especially during the pandemic, when mail is slow, not everybody's got a portal. I'm trying to consolidate all the statements that come in every month and make sure the authors are aware of how many books are sold and if there's any money out. So I suppose I could see the potential for that problem if I if somebody said to me, hey, let me take over your bookkeeping and accounting. You look like you need your help. And and then they start doing weird stuff that I'm unaware of. But, you know, I don't know how um, the founders of that agency could have given that person authority to do all this without really any oversight. You know, that seems like a big mistake. Right. So um, Monjo is uh, is saying, it sounds like having an agent is the best way when negotiating with a large publisher. But if a debut author is negotiating with an indie press and can't afford a publishing lawyer, are there other resources? And then the Chai T chimes in and says, once you have a contract offer, you can join the Authors Guild. Your dues give you access to lawyers that can look over your contract for red flags. That's true. And the Authors Guild, I didn't think I mentioned, just posted uh, their contract things for everybody. They just said, all of you guys that haven't joined the Authors Guild, we're worried about you. We want you to know what to fight for. So please look at this. Right. I think one I of the think problems with the Authors Guild is you can't, the reason why they opened it up is because if you're a self-published author, you can't. If you're super small, like I think it costs, I'm not sure what it takes to qualify you for them, but I think they're worried that people who, they're losing people that can't join and they want them to have this information. Right. Did I miss any questions? Does anyone want to post a few final ones? We're coming up on our hour, but um, you can still squeeze in a few questions if there are more. Again, this will be recorded, so by all means, we can go back and, and if you'd, if you'd like to, um, email Sam or I or just email me and I can get um, I can get your question over to Sam if I have the answer I'll, I'll uh, answer it for you I'll just post my email address in the chat here I can post the author's guild link uh, here there's 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 two there's one for main contracts and the other one is for translation contracts and translation contracts can have their own issues like you want to, uh, authors usually want to approve of who the translator is because sometimes a publisher will just randomly pick a translator or somebody that they know that may be a wrong translator for your book for whatever reason. Right. You should have the right to do that. There, there you go, the Authors Guild, you can see that. So that's free now. Up until last week, you would have to have paid for that. Any final questions? Or anything you want to leave us with, Sam? Um, yeah, I think I think I'm going to leave you again with that idea that that when you start, the contracts are going to be very unfair, and you you basically have to try to fight. Having access to things like the Writers Guild uh, it, it will at least give you the knowledge of when you sign that contract, like what you might have to watch out for later, because you might not have been in a position of power to negotiate back. So um, I think ideally, you know, authors get better and better with every book uh, in terms of their their dealings if they're doing it on their own but you know if you can get it i know with a small press a lot of agents won't necessarily come on board if there's no advance or if it's a very small advance because what what the agents want to do with their time is say you know i want to believe in your project and i want to go out and like when we're good what we do is we create like a bidding situation with people where we can try to get you you know my 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 goal Every single book that I put out is to get two or three publishers interested and then to have a bidding war and then have essentially that's the point where we can change the contract because I'll tell somebody, well, there's other people that want this book. If you want it, um, you're going to have to change all these, give us all these things. And then that's when I can push back the, the hardest because then they have to say, well, we really want this book. We know that these other guys, our competitors are going to take it. So we will give into a bunch of these things. That's usually the only time that they'll do it. And even then they'll say that, you know, this is non citable and um, it's not a precedent. So you can't go back and say, well, you did that before and now you have to do it again. They'll say, this is a one-time thing that we're going to do. And uh, that's how they, 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 that's how they get you. 
Good stuff. So I know Mary Jo there is saying it's it's great stuff, interesting and overwhelming at the same time. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, like like any contracts, there's a lot going on, a lot to know, much more not to know. Um, but I think this has been very helpful for, for me anyway. Um, unless there are any final questions, I suppose it looks like we'll wrap it. So so thanks again, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Sam, for uh, you, sharing too. all this. Have a good um, ride right high day. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference, people. Um, but in the meantime, if you want to keep in touch with us, please do join our uh, weekly email list. We'll share some great uh, resources every week. You can do that with the link I just posted in the chat. Um, all right, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Sam. Take care. Bye, guys. All right, bye-bye.